You're listening to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast, where we tackle some of the biggest questions facing our ocean today by speaking to experts and voices from the world of oceanography. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr. Zoe Jacobs, um, and today I'm joined by Dr. Ella Darlington to get to grips with what it takes to plan a scientific expedition. Um, so hello, thank you for joining us today. Not a problem, thanks for having me. So... We've recently been doing um, or starting these podcasts with a random ocean question. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask you, what has been your most memorable experience at sea and why? I was on a Norwegian vessel and we were doing some work up in the Arctic and it was a sea ice program. So we were out on the out on the ice mm. and we'd always have somebody watching out for polar bears. Mm. And, um, <laughs> and there'd always be a call on over the tannoy of like... Um, uh, my Norwegian is terrible, but mm. sort of ice bjorn polar bear. Mm. And one day we saw this polar bear and it, there were two of them eating a seal. Mm. And it's one of my favorite photos, actually, because it's kind of gruesome. Might go in a downstairs loo sort of thing yeah. of this <laughs> polar bear <laughs> eating a seal. And um, I, it was just one of those wonderful moments where you see something a little bit sort of David Attenborough-like yeah. that I never expected to see. Yeah. And um, and just the remoteness of that moment of just being on the ship, thankfully, and nowhere near the bear mm. itself. Yeah. <laughs> but just to be able to capture it as a yeah. as a as an sort of an afar. Looking yeah. There, looking in. Wow. Yeah. But that's amazing. Um. Okay. Thanks. So let's get stuck in. Um, so can you tell us a bit about your scientific background? So your PhD was in ice ocean interactions. Is that right? It was. Yeah. yeah. So as a kid, I was really interested in science and meteorology and I really wanted to work in the Antarctic and I used to print off job applications mm -hmm. and pin them on the fridge of the, this is what I need to do to be a sort of polar scientist. And I think my parents, you know, they went along with this, which was very nice of them and encouraged <laughs> And then really it was like, how do I get there? And um, and so I did a um, undergraduate and master's in oceanography mm -hmm. at Southampton. And then I went on to do a PhD at Loughborough University together with British Antarctic Survey. Yeah. But that actually started out in Antarctic meteorology. So okay. I, yeah, so really different. Mm. Um, and it was looking at the mass balance of the East Antarctic ice sheet. Mm. Um, sponsored by a commercial company who during my PhD actually went bankrupt oh. uh, <laughs> so that, that, that was the end of that one um, but we had a secondary project up our sleeves to do okay. some work up in the Arctic so up in you. Svalbard <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that's really the one I took forward um, which was actually really exciting and um, uh, yeah so I was very lucky I did get to go to the Antarctic because mm -hmm. I was promised my white Christmas yay um, but <laughs> I also managed to finally get the PhD at the end of it as well um, amazing from uh, from Loughborough cool um, so what was it like working in the polar regions um, I was going to ask if you had any interesting stories we've already had one <laughs> but any other interesting stories <laughs> Uh, it's it's brilliant. Uh, yeah. You know, it really solidifies an element of teamwork, mm -hmm. remoteness, having to be prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and being at Loughborough, we didn't have a big um, sort of like polar research centre. Um, and so it was very much me on my project. And so I saw everything through from the very beginning of getting the money in to be able to mm. do additional bits of field yeah. work. Uh, but then also all the logistics, flights, sort of making connections with the Norwegians to get field seasons in and so it was a really involved process and I just I enjoyed the challenge of seeing that succeed yeah. and then at the end of it got some data as well which was also incredibly interesting but it was really the team effort of getting these projects off the ground in in crazy remote places yeah um yeah yeah I can imagine so other than the polar bear do we have any other cool stories that you can remember oh I mean the we Doing some work in Iceland, uh, okay. we had um, we rented a small boat mm -hmm. to um, go out into this fjord, and it was it was wonderful. You know, you have all the tourists on the beach because all the icebergs wash up, and then we were taking the small boat out to try and get as close as possible to the ice edge, and it was just it was a really again a really nice one where you can um, uh, see things from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, but on that trip was also supporting somebody with their um, aeolian work, so um, wind land mm -hmm. processes. And they had these fantastic trucks because the Icelandic people love 
designing like four by fours or six by six trucks. They're massive. And so we would hire these these trucks. It was nothing like enterprise. It was more like, I don't know, Joe's backyard yeah. rentals. <laughs> and they would always break down. So probably every four days we'd be back in the workshop and then you'd get a different truck and go back out again. But again, it was the people that really made it. And it was the, um, yeah, just their willingness to help support and be involved in something which was probably a bit different from what they're used to. Yeah, um, I can imagine. So, yeah. and and with that, actually, the the uh, in both the Icelandic and the Norwegian work, food always was like <laughs> a real uplifter. So when oh, yeah. working out on the sea ice, <laughs> Um, they would send down little parcels of um, of waffles and the Norwegian brown cheese, which I grew to love. <laughs> and then in Iceland, they'd always joke about going shark fishing. And strangely, well, not strangely, it shouldn't be strange at all, but it felt strange at the time. The chaps would stay home and look after the kids and I would go out with their wives and we would go shark fishing, yeah. um, which was just standing on the seashores, like fishing. And it was a really nice experience yeah. to actually feel like, part of that little community for a few months while we yeah. were out there yeah I bet so how long would you typically spend when you're doing these kind of expeditions I guess it varies it varies yeah. it was normally about a month which is quite a nice okay. time it's enough yeah. time to feel like you're there yeah. but it's not too long um that you know you're there all all the time yeah. um but because I was going back each year yeah um got to know the people again and again yeah which was nice yeah no that's really cool um so your role is to oversee our research uh, ships yep. and the National Marine Equipment Pool. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us, a, tell us a bit about the ships and, um, and the equipment pool? Certainly. So the National Oceanography Centre mm -hmm. um, operates two global class research vessels, mm -hmm. Royal Research Ship James Cook mm -hmm. and also Discovery. And they are um, multidisciplinary research platforms and there's only... In the grand scheme of things, there's a handful of these in the world that operate on this global scale and have the capabilities that we have on board. Each of the vessels um, holds 54 people, so mm -hmm. we'll have 22 crew, mm -hmm. um, 32 technicians mm -hmm. and scientists. And the work that we do on board can vary f anything from sort of two weeks out to six, seven weeks in okay. length. And we do absolutely everything you can think of. So we do ROV work, we deploy and recover moorings, mm -hmm. we do a lot of um, benthic ecology work, mm -hmm. um, some trawling, picking up, uh, they're not really creeper crawlies, but <laughs> samples from the seafloor. Um, and so each each different expedition that we that we do is very different from the one before. Okay. So if you think of the ships as sort of a blank canvas, mm. um, we then change it around. New scientists come on board and uh, and then they put all their equipment on and then we go off and do what they want. Cool. And it's not just for scientists at NOC. It's a national provision. So we're commissioned by the Natural okay. Environment Research mm -hmm. Council. Yeah. Um, and so we are the national service provider of these facilities. So if anyone from any university in the UK or research institute can apply to, to use them. Okay. And what about the equipment pool? So the equipment pool is all the stuff that we then go and put on onto the ships. Yeah. So that's everything from um, coring mm -hmm. to the ROV mm -hmm. or things like bottom at boat face. Mm -hmm. um, so even if things are autonomous, they still form part of the pool. And this is really, it's a very efficient way of having a huge amount of equipment that the community can use, mm. but that is also effectively maintained. Yeah. Um, and we work closely with the data center. So we sort of look at the whole life cycle of the data that we get from the moment that we're collecting it to how it's been stored to really try and um, make that process as efficient as possible. Mm. Um, and really, it means that by having it as a national pool, you don't end up with bits of equipment sat in individual universities yeah. that don't get used for years and years. And then yeah. when you do want to use it, it, it's no good anymore. So it's a really efficient way of being able to support the UK community. Yeah, definitely. Um, and do we have all of that equipment here at NOC or is it kind of? Pretty much everything is here okay. at NOC. Yeah. Um, there's a little bit up at Sands in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, most of it is under the roof yeah yeah um and it's interesting because depending on the time of year um it could look like the workshops are really busy with all of mm. this equipment and then other times a year it looks like the workshops are empty yeah because it's they're all being used uh, like the equipment's all out 
being used. Yeah. And we we program really efficiently to be able to use all the equipment um, to the best of the ability that mm. we can. Um, and so we're currently looking out to sort of 2025, sort of putting all the puzzle pieces together of working out where all the equipment will be, yeah. having to think about the freight, logistics, yes. all the time for that. Yeah. And the, the other part with the equipment is it doesn't have to just be on our ships that we operate. We send equipment to the Sir David Attenborough mm -hmm. and we also support, we've just finished supporting actually um, some expeditions on an American vessel, the RV Endeavour, and we're looking to put equipment on a Taiwanese vessel next mm -hmm. year. So the the equipment and our people go on multiple ships yeah. all across the world um, at any one time. Yeah. So you need lots of forward thinking. <laughs> lots of forward thinking. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Which is why, I'm, what, like, it sounds terrible, but sometimes, you know, if I'm doing a lot of planning in 2025 yeah. and then somebody's asking for something, you know, in two months' time, I'm like, oh, no. Yeah, you know, it's, that's gone. <laughs> yeah, too so, late. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so a big part of your role is organising uh, research expeditions, right? So um, what kind of preparation goes into it? Okay, so I really do the, I'm going to say the the high level planning of piecing together mm -hmm. what goes into it. Yeah. I have a team of five fantastic project managers yeah. who do all the detail planning and mm -hmm. really make the magic happen yeah. on the ground together with the technicians and, and the ship's crew. But from my point of view, um, each April, I'm given a stack of applications mm -hmm which we have helped develop with the scientists sort of over the year or 18 months beforehand. But that April benchmark is where we know what's been funded. And so they come to us and they go, I've been funded, got some yeah. money. Um, when can I get into the program? Mm -hmm. And I work very closely with marine planning at NERC. And we put together this integrated program. Mm -hmm. and it's interesting because some of the projects will have really short timescales. You know, it needs to be from the 1st of May to the 13th of May, you know, yeah. really short. <laughs> and then others are like any time of the year. Yeah. But it needs to be in this location. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's, you have the time, uh, you know, the different times when the work needs to be done. Mm. You also have different geographical mm -hmm. locations. So we work globally. So we've had work out in the Pacific recently. Yeah. And we're mainly Atlantic based, but the entirety of the, Atl yeah. of the Atlantic um, and then the equipment and the personnel to go with it so wow. it's um, it's a really it's a big jigsaw puzzle mm. just putting it all together and working out the most effective and efficient way of doing it yeah I'm imagining like a really complicated spreadsheet <laughs> it is <laughs> it is so we've actually um, we've developed software in not called the marine facilities planning tool mm -hmm that's a website and it handles an awful lot of this planning already um so it's everything you know, so the scientists put their applications yeah. in through the system we assess them and then eventually it gets programmed and then it's the project management workflow in there mm. that the um that the project managers mm -hmm. use but this has been picked up globally by the americans australians a yeah. lot of europe so it's really nice when we're talking to other research vessel operators that they all now work on the mfp so we can see what they're doing yeah and more and more we're trying to think of not just our sort of national marine equipment pool or just mm -hmm. sort of our ships but thinking more internationally mm -hmm to be able to have more um, effective use of ship yes. time. So we have less empty passages and we can use other people's facilities mm. as well as our own. And likewise, yeah. they can come and use ours. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so it's sort of a swap. Yeah, try and be nice and efficient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I bet there are some unexpected challenges that can come up when you're planning these things. There are, yeah. <laughs> and it, it varies from every expedition. And I'd say in the last few years, we've had some pretty big ones. Mm. Um, yeah, global Asia. pandemic. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that, was, large one. that was a bit of yes. a large one. And then just as we thought we were getting out of that, um, you know, we had the fuel crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and so overnight, the fuel prices um, doubled in marine gas oil, wow. yeah. um, which for many other nations, they cancelled a lot of their expeditions right. because they became unaffordable. Gosh. And we were very lucky. We had a few tricks up our sleeves to get around that. Um, but then also the logistics as mm. well. And... When you're freighting things down to South America and you're expecting it back in Southampton at some point in time and it doesn't arrive, yeah. you need to find something else. So there's a big logistics piece to play in all of this. Yeah, I can imagine. I was part of a big project a few years ago, um, Solstice, where they had some equipment that got stuck in customs and it kind of just throws everything off 
completely doesn't it absolutely <laughs> and you just and, you, and you've spent all these months planning or years yeah. planning and then it's all reliant on the shipping container I and, know. and is it going to arrive and yeah. the paperwork and so I think that there's an awful lot that goes into every every expedition yeah. and then you know the other part is equipment failure and mm. so one of the other major things we had recently was the James Cook had a propulsion motor fail mm. and so this uh, we had to get her into dry dock really quickly and that was several months out of the program so then it's a rescheduling of everything mm. that was in that slot to the following year and yeah. understanding those yeah. knock-ons so it happens and but I think the main thing is is that everyone just gets on with it you yeah know, and everyone understands it. Yeah, all the science community requesting it understand as well exactly yeah yeah exactly um so in your opinion what's the most important part of a successful expedition safety safety it sounds really dull (laughs) was not expecting that okay (laughs) (laughs) but at the end of the day you want everyone coming home safe and sound and you know ideally you know there'll be you know, absolutely fantastic imagery or, you know, data and all Mm -hmm. of that that's going to support this Mm -hmm. world-class science that we do. But I think it's really easy to forget just how complex the operations are that we do. There's heavy machinery, there's cranes, there's, you know, we've got um, several kilometers of cable on board each of the ships, you know, most of our Mm. wires are probably 10 Mm. 10 kilometers long. So that's from here sort of up to Eastly and mm. you know up to the airport yeah, there exactly. so it's a, it's a lot and um and really there's also with that a lot of safety protocol that go with it but we always say that safety is our number one priority yeah. and that's yeah, that's it <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but otherwise aside from safety um <laughs> you want everyone to to not only get really good data because mm. that's all that's the primary aim yeah. for for the vessels mm-hmm. and for the equipment mm-hmm. but also to be learning and so to be able to take their data and go and learn something from it and to have that feeling that they are making an impact to you know this better understanding of our oceans mm. and really that all starts um you know with the data collection itself yeah um yeah so it's nice to feel like a, a part of that going through yeah for sure um, okay, so when we think about ocean exploration, um, things like marine autonomy and advanced technology mm-hmm. are playing a much bigger role now. Um, how does this affect the expeditions? Um, they're becoming more complicated. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that we've you know we've worked around this sort of thing before with uh, with moorings. So you deploy a mooring and then you need to go and pick it up in mm. say twelve to twenty four months yeah. time. The thing with autonomy is that its lifespan is much less at the moment, mm. so you need to go and pick it up sooner. Yeah. Um, but I think there's like real benefit in that you can, the way in which you can expand your measurements from the ship mm. by using autonomy, mm-hmm. because whilst the ship is engaged in operations over the side with wires, you can then deploy your autonomy, and then that can go off and collect all this you know extra yeah. data. It also provides a means of collecting data without a ship. Mm, so we're good. looking a lot at shore launched expeditions mm-hmm. at the moment, which has a whole new level of, I guess, expedition planning and logistics yeah. that come into it. Yeah. Because all of a sudden you we end up with rather than sort of a program of 10 to 15 sort of r- really big projects mm. to deliver each year. Mm. We have... Um, I don't know, 30 much smaller yeah. projects. And so the overhead on the planning is still there. You still need to make sure that all the small boats yeah, are course, safe. Yeah. Um, and and so it's it's a real evolution at the moment as we change into that. So it's going to be an interesting decade, and I'll say probably yeah. the next 10 to 30 years, yeah. as to how the, um, you know, the research infrastructure evolves into something that you know, the next generation will be using. Yeah, so... Are there any kind of, what are the major changes in technology that you're seeing? Would you say it's mostly the autonomy? It's mainly the autonomy. Yeah. And um, particularly within NOC, the mm. auto sub long range, yeah. which no one else has anything like this. Mm. Um, and so it's a real attractive piece of equipment. Mm. You can put a lot of sensors on yeah. board and you can do things with it that you couldn't do with a ship. And so there was, um, uh, recently there was a, uh, a volcano eruption around Tonga mm-hmm. and so from there they did a ship-based 
survey but because of safety they couldn't take the ship in any closer right. so then they used AUVs to go and do oh. detailed surveys mm -hmm. at the work site so it's interesting that they can go places that yeah. the ships can't and also the resolution of the data can be a lot better because you've got a vehicle right yeah. there on the seafloor yeah, or near the seafloor yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah all really handy um so what's next for our research ships um are there any exciting expeditions for James Cook or the Discovery coming up always yeah <laughs> exciting so the discovery is currently up in the arctic she's mm -hmm. north uh well she's um just east of svalbard okay um uh, which is an exciting one for us because we've not been up there in mm. a long time yeah and then over the next 12 months we'll be headed uh discovery will then be headed over to canada and then down to south africa mm -hmm. and then finally she'll be doing some work off of the congo so doing some okay. congo canyon work which okay will be yeah very exciting and the James Cook is going to head back to the Pacific. Okay. Uh, so it's the second part of the expedition that mm -hmm. we were doing over there last year. Yeah. So she'll be doing that. And then in summer 2024, uh, is, summer is always really busy for us. It tends to be the North Atlantic mm -hmm. period of time. Mm -hmm. So both ships will be working in the North yeah. Atlantic. But then after that, not to say that the North Atlantic isn't exciting, um, but the after that, We'll be sending Discovery back down to sort of the South Africa region, mm -hmm. and um, and the James Cook will be headed to Argentina, um, sort of Buenos Aires mm. area. Um, wow! So they're really going all over, which is which is nice. They're yeah. maximizing the time that they have on science and minimizing the passage. So yeah. it's really efficient, particularly as we think about the geographical coverage of the science we support and also yeah. the carbon footprint that yes. comes with that as that's being accounted yeah. for at the moment as well yeah amazing cool lots of exciting stuff coming up then there's loads there's yeah. loads and it's <laughs> also oh I, I didn't mention the mediterranean we've got one in the mediterranean mm. um coming up which again we've not been yeah been there. Say. so that's mm. some rov work for cool. a, um, an noc project cool so well, sounds there's, amazing there's loads yeah <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us today it's been a pleasure to talk to you no problem thank, thank you. you if you're enjoying into the blue please make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes new episodes are released every other wednesday on all major platforms and are also available to watch on the noc's youtube see you next time